Hi, this is Paul at Focus Pulling, and I'm trying this for a second time after doing this a couple of months ago when the Sony RX0 came out. I thought there could be some value to hooking it up to an Atomos Shogun through the HDMI port, throwing the menus on screen and walking through them. Um, what seemed to be of value on that one and what I hope is on this one is that in the process of sort of going through all of the menu options sort of tutorial style, what also can emerge from that is a sort of review of the A7R 3 that doesn't quite compete with a huge volume of reviews and opinions about Sony's new flagship, but rather sort of complement it with some very specific insights. And the overall gist of this is going to be to really favor um, video shooters as opposed to still photography, even though still photography issues will come up. And at the screen we're at right now to start off with, it's a great example of how what we're thrown into first is the theme that when we talk about the A7R 3 it really is still primarily a stills camera, still a stills camera. And the first obvious fact is we can't forget the fact that the sucker is in the form factor of a mirrorless portable camera. Or if you want to be derogatory, it's a purse camera for heaven's sake, right? So it's pretty tough showing up on a cinema shoot with this tiny little thing and being taken seriously. But the fact is it does take phenomenal um, video. And it does so up to full frame format, which even the Arri Alexa can't do. And which very few other video cameras on the market can do in this log format, high bit rate, 4K video, and so on. So there's going to be a lot of stuff in these menus, especially at, to begin with that are photocentric. I'm going to kind of skip over them, but might come back to them. But to start off with, let's look at these top six tabs. And this will be a little bit of an intro to people who have never used a Sony camera, but mostly it'll be review because most people have used Sony cameras where this is really familiar, but Sony is finally more migrating away from um, its prior logic when it comes to these menu layouts because what they've done in the past is they'd really sort of blended too many things together you could call that interleaved now they've sort of isolated the video from the photo and more what we have in the first tab is I would call leans towards photography whereas in the second tab it leans toward video slash movie and indeed you see that on the first sub category under the tab. So each of these tabs are going to have pages, if you will, that you cycle through. This is page one of nine on movie. And then just to finish out the review of the tabs at the top, you also have something for network that you'll rarely use, but that is about connecting to a smartphone or even to the internet with regard to transferring files and controlling the camera in a very limited way. And then playback, all the issues of not only file management, but playback of your pictures and organization and so on. Setup, which is a pretty huge uh, and important part of using and optimizing your Sony a7R 3 which we'll get to kind of in order here, um, but uh, we won't do first. And then this is the new thing. It's kind of cool, and yet I certainly haven't exploited it as much as maybe the Sony engineers dreamed I would. I'm not sure how much value I'm going to get out of this, but this is a way to create your own custom menus. Part of the fear here is simply that um, if I do this for this camera, you know, there's no easy way of replicating that on any future generation. And so it's a kind of an investment of time into getting familiar with something that just might disappear on you the next generation down. So what I recommend for myself and maybe for you is let's just kind of stick with knowing how things work and where they are in the Sony a7R 3 menus from the start. And then if we want to make something custom, there might be a reason, but it'd be best to start off with like, you know, knowing how to play Johann Sebastian Bach on the piano and then moving on to Stravinsky when we've mastered the basics, right? Something like that. So starting with this what would we call tab one and page one, since I am only really mostly talking about video, I have to say that all this stuff is really something to glide by, except for this super crucial big picture issue of APS-C slash super 35 millimeter. 
So quickly, what does that mean? Sorry, this is probably redundant to almost everybody. But this is a way of basically toggling between the best uh, that this camera has to offer in terms of still photography, which is to say using the full frame sensor that is in some regards 35 millimeters, but in reality is something almost that. But we use that as a reference point based on the legacy of film negatives, which we called 35 millimeters. And then what has also emerged over time is that with digital cameras that used smaller than 35 millimeter sensors, we used to call that APS-C, but it turns out that's about the same size as what I think in the video space heavily we call super 35 millimeters. So some of the flagship cameras in the super 35 millimeter video world have been, for example, the one of my early favorites, the NEX FS100, then the FS700. Um, if you want to talk in the Canon world, all of the um, cinema EOS cameras are in the um, super 35 millimeter video acquisition, at least, format. Um, the C Canon 5D Mark uh, 1, 2, 3, and currently 4 shoot 4K video in full frame. But what's going on here is sort of simple and yet complicated, but the short digest version is, at least in my view, that Sony is giving us the, ch the opportunity to toggle between using a reduced portion of the full frame sensor, given the pixel density slash size of the photo sites that they put on the full frame sensor of this A7R3, and that's in comparison to the A7S2. I'm going to toggle in here so we don't get bored looking at the same thing forever. But in this screen here, you can see how we're able to have it automatically select between, actually what this is implying is, between APS-C slash Super 35 millimeter and full frame acquisition. And that auto selection depends simply on the metadata of the lens that you have attached to the camera. So if it's a native Sony lens, then they totally talk to each other, they understand each other, and when you hook it in, it says, yeah, I get it. You have connected a full frame lens, so automatically, I'm gonna figure that you probably wanna shoot in uh, full frame. Now, if you hooked in a, uh, a, a crop lens is what we call it. In other words, that's a lens where the glass is designed to direct light only to a smaller sensor area that is the characteristic of cameras like the Canon 7D as opposed to the 5D. Or in the case of Sony, the A6500 instead of the A7 series. So um, if you put one of those lenses on in this auto mode, then the entire camera basically kicks itself into um, Super 35 APS-C mode. And that means that um, a smaller portion of the full frame sensor is being lit up, if you will, or are the photosites in that portion of the sensor are pulling the uh, image data. So what does that mean? It means that on this A7R3, that can be theoretically a slightly better place to be for video because of the fact that when you cram a bunch of photo sites um, together um, at a very high pixel density um, and try to spread that out, though, over a full frame, you're going to have to downsample so much because the resolution was originally so high that even when you dance downsample to something that sounded so outlandishly high as 4K a few years ago, it's still crazy low because the native uh, megapixel resolution of the A7R3 is way, 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 way higher than 4K video, which is 3,840 lines by 2,160 lines. Um, and you multiply those two and you have the number of dots on the screen. So, um, when the A7R2 came out, tests were showing that the A7R2's uh, performance in the video mode was pretty appreciably better in APS-C Super 35 millimeter mode. What has emerged with the A7R3, probably on the processor front, as opposed to anything that's changed about the sensor, 
is that Sony's kind of gotten things uh, improved a bit, particularly in the area of aliasing. Aliasing is where you get those stair-steppy, jagged edges. And aliasing is the Achilles heel of dramatic downsampling from a high megapixel sensor down to um, something more realistic that is 4K video. So um, we went through this top function that has auto. Now, in, in this regard, um, when it says manual here, um, what I can also do is I can manually tell it to um, shoot in... Um, APS-C Super 35. This is sort of an override. So what this means is that no matter what lens I have attached up here, I'm telling it I really at this moment want to shoot in so-called crop mode. I only want to use a smaller portion of the sensor. Um, up here, I could say manual. And what that would mean is that it would only um, honor this. So why would I choose APS-C Super 35 millimeter mode in video mode in particular um, now that Sony has improved things so much that it's, that it's almost indistinguishable between the two modes? And the answer is quite simple. If you use prime lenses, for example, as I do most of the time, um, there are times when you're in a pinch and you just don't have a, the time to change to another, another lens or the the widest aperture on one type of prime lens is just that sweet spot you need for the amount of light you're working under and therefore changing the focal length through this process of activating crop or turning it off is a totally legit strategy so i leave it on manual and i turn it to off pretty much uh, all the time so that i'm using the full frame sensor gathering as much light as possible the greatest depth of field um, that I can manage in and out, up and down. Um, but on, on those rare occasions when I need to punch in a little more, um, I know that I can do that in post with 4K if my output is 1080p. But also, even if I keep things in native 4K, I can punch in a little more this way. And the punch-in ratio, I think it's, I don't know, it's something around 1.6 times. Um, so that can buy you a little bit. We spent a hell of a lot of time on crop, but it's like the huge talking point slash theme of the A7R three, and it's why a lot of very serious filmmakers would still prefer this over a forthcoming A7S three, and certainly the A7S two. And the reason will be quite simply that um, they're pretty cool with the video. It's good enough. The light sensitivity might be just slightly less, but um, it's already great with a full frame sensor. And again, the difference between shooting in full frame versus APS-C Super 35 millimeter, the gap is closed significantly. I mean, you're really nitpicking if you're seeing problems there. Page two. So in page two, we're back to that same issue of, yes, this is totally uh, a photo-centric uh, tab. And under this tab on page two, we're getting more of this still photography stuff. I'm going to skip past it, only mentioning briefly what these things do. We're talking about noise reduction, which is processing the images in the process or in the method of storing stills in real time. You get what I'm saying there? So basically, real time processing of the image where there's no turning back is another way of putting it a little more dramatically. All right. So you snap a picture. But even before it stores it onto your SD card, it's already making decisions about reducing noise. Um, uh, it's, it's making a choice about which color space we go between, you know, sRGB and Adobe RGB. We'd usually stay in sRGB in the digital space instead of the print space. Um, and lens compensation issues, that's about taking sort of lens distortion and working it out. The theme here should be for still photographers that these are kind of all things you can do in Adobe Lightroom or Adobe, Adobe Photoshop. So just like the fundamental sort of decisions, decisions that you make when you shoot in um, log color profiles versus Cinegamut or whatever, or I mean, well, regular um, camera pro color profiles, is that you do well to preserve for yourself the ability to make all of these decisions, not as you record onto the media, but rather later on. So, you know, none of these are particularly destructive, but anyways, that's what this is about. It'll come up later too. Um, mostly on this 
third page of the first tab, we're still in the space of photography issues like bracket mode. That's like whether you, when you rapid fire a bunch of sequential still photographs, stuff like that. But, and then I'm actually going to skip this for now because it's really kind of a settings thing. In fact, you know, talk about Sony's slow evolution of what to put in what tab. This feels so much like a settings um, thing. It belongs there in my mind. And I'd say that about this too, but while you're shooting, this is something you're probably going to be making decisions on regularly. One of the cool new features that Sony has never offered on the A7 series so far is two media slots. One of them is in UHS-2, which is the very much faster media format. So first big, like, save your money caution about UHS-2 you don't need a card that shoots in UHS-2 if you're a filmmaker. The only reason you'd ever need one of those super expensive, overpriced SD cards that is compatible with slot one only, not slot two, is that is if you were shooting bracket still photography in, let's say in particular in RAW, where the sort of throughput rates of the data being transferred onto the card are so fast that your card needs to catch keep up with it in 4k video especially with the codec being used on the a7r 3s internal recorder um, the bit rate is crazy low compared to the capabilities of a normal sd card so uhs-1 is a spec that already exceeds the maximum capabilities of the highest bit rate of 4K video in this camera. So the bottom line is pretty much any UHS-1 SD card that costs literally a matter of $20, $30, $40, $50 is totally enough for the A7R 3 shooting video. End of story. Don't be persuaded otherwise. What's going on here with select media is that now that they've offered this really cool option, I went off on a tangent talking about media um, sort of uh, characteristics, but you can put one SD card in each of these two slots. They don't have to match. They don't have to be the same manufacturer, same size or anything, but you can have it, and we'll get to the setting later on about how this works, but you can have it be so that instead of it recording only in one, you can have it record both on both cards at the same time of a single acquisition. So in other words, if I'm shooting video, you can rest assured that there will be a mirror image copy on both the card in slot one and two. Um, or the other thing is the other mode that we'll get to later, I kind of am tempted to go there now, but we want to get out of order, is there's another mode where it'll automatically flip to the second card as soon as the first card fills up. So it's kind of an insurance policy against running out of space and, and not realizing it. Um, but you can also make choices in this particular menu setting about which slot you want to record onto. So, okay, cool. Page four. Skip. So once again, we're in uh, the still photography realm when we talk about this particular function. And Sony wasted a whole page on this. Why? I don't know. Okay, uh, page five is starting to get into, you know, in my mind, the real revolution of the A7R3 is its extraordinary autofocus ability. So the snobbery um, is everlasting when it comes to filmmakers about manual focus being the absolute only way to do anything if you're, quote, professional, right? But the world has delivered us little toys like gimbals. So, yeah, I mean, you just can't pull that off. Now, Emmanuel Lubezki, you know, shooting a film for Terrence Malick, has got a dedicated guy with a little knob in his hand that is constantly pulling focus. And he's so good at it as an industry veteran that he can, you know, sometimes just look at how far the subject appears to be from the camera and just turn the knob to what he knows after years and years is the right distance. Um, that we're describing right now a unionized Hollywood set with the manpower and the budget and the time to have this crew that can basically, you know, 
be your full-time assistant while you're shooting in circumstances, especially like a gimbal. By that, I mean a three-axis sort of steady cam device, right? Um, it's just not realistic. So 99.9% of the rest of us um, would like a better solution than A, raising the ISO really high so that there's uh, a very wide depth of field. And by again, by wide depth of field is counterintuitive. That means everything's in focus at the same time, the foreground and the background. Then you don't have to worry about focus, right? Well, the problem is there the noise floor goes up and, you know, you don't have what I like to call focus isolation, what the Brooklyn hipsters, the Vimeo clip of the day people, staff pick people call cool or whatever you want to call it. But it's been overused, but it's still a fundamental of cinematography that you want to have the background out of focus most of the time. You want to direct the audience's eyes to the things that you believe in your composition are the most important. So... Um, shooting on a Steadicam or a three-axis gimbal stabilizer um, with shallow focus was always a total nightmare. I think this is the first time really in the history of digital cinematography that it was really actually finally possible to just let the autofocus nail it because I think um, Sony's gone farther than anybody else. I mean, somebody else will kick Sony's ass and I'll be cheering them on for doing so. But, you know, big props to Sony right now for doing that. Okay, so we're on the page, though, that firstly and obviously toggles between autofocus and manual focus. So, yeah, I mean, there's no turning back from the fact that the most of the time you're making a serious piece of art, making a serious film, whatever you do, um, you're going to have it in manual focus mode. So that's where I have my sort of default settings, right, my preset. But here's autofocus continuous. Why is this stuff all grayed out? Don't be afraid. Why is it grayed out? It's because currently, I should have clarified earlier, I am in movie mode. I am not in stills photography mode. So these grayed out things means totally irrelevant. Like, why would I have single shot autofocus mode when I have autofocus on um, in video mode? It's not relevant because there's no single shot, right? So continuous autofocus or manual are the only two relevant. So I'm going to turn on autofocus continuous and having turned it on then uh oops back to the menu what do i have here well i have some things that remain only relevant to still photography you know i have to say once again this is where sony um, leaves tons of room for their own improvement because they've interleaved a bunch of still photography autofocus settings instead of isolating them into a um, a movie filmmaker centric, um, you know, menu area where it becomes relevant in particular. And I might miss a few things here, but I certainly have gone through all of these and chosen the ones that actually were practical tools during the types of, um, gimbal motion filmmaking that I've done. Focus area is a really important decision that you have to make when it comes to, let's say, flying on a gimbal, or in any case, just in general, shooting autofocus in movie mode. Wide is surprisingly still the bland, generic, conservative choice that still is the place I think you're going to be most of the time. You can add layers on top of wide that we'll get to, which include, most importantly, face detection to the extent that you're doing character-based drama. Um... But anyways, we can look at the other categories down here, such as zone, and understand the fact that when you go to zone, you're selecting, you see how there's those three marks? We can go into this and kind of select it. Um, you can move around what the zone is. So I'm using the new cool joystick cursor thing to move the zone. But let me go back to the menu. That's sort of, you know, choosing between uh, three stripes, if you will, vertical stripes. And I think that's very much sort of bound in, in, in sort of theme to the rule of thirds. It's my view of it anyway. If you're doing an interview and you've offset the figure to the left or they're in the middle of the screen or on the right of the screen, this is a way of saying I've made my choice about what third of the screen is going to be where um, most of my in-focus material should be. And then autofocus sort of concentrates on that 
quote, zone. So that's why, where we get the name. In center, it's as simple as it sounds. This is basically saying center zone. So it's almost a subset of the prior zone category, but especially simplified. Then we get to a much more um, flexible zoning, if you will. Um, and then it's funny how there's variants on this, right? So there's flexible spot, and when you select it, it brings you back to your view where you're presented with this little sort of centered bracket, but centered is just the starting point. One of the great new hardware features of the A7R3 is a little, so they call it a joystick. Um, it's more like a thumb pad, really. But um, right above the dial and to the left of it, there's something where if you tap it up, down, left, right, in this mode, you can actually change where the focus is going to focus on. So let's say, for example, that I'm interviewing somebody and um, it's locked down on a tripod and their face isn't going to move anywhere. It's staying put. It might shift a little bit from left to right, but this bracket is a way of basically locating my focus point on the subject's face. And once it's there, um, I am all set. I can keep moving it if I like. I can also reset it back to the center to start over again by hitting the center sort of detente of the joystick like I'm right, right now. But that was that focus area flexible spot. A relative of that is expand flexible spot. And it's not much more complicated than just when you select it, being able to move this around, but letting the thing in the center have what they call primary uh, focus um, significance. And then they refer to things in regards to the second outer set of brackets and beyond to be secondary focus and uh, 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 subject. So that's something that um, I think is probably the more conservative choice, if you will. Um, you run the risk of honing in a little too much on one subject matter, expand flexible spot, is sort of a safer thing, especially if you have a lot of contrast between foreground and background anyway, which again, using the interview example would, would very much be the case. So I think in the bottom line on these two modes of flexible spot are it's still spot metering. And that means that you really have to have controlled circumstances, not running and gunning. Um, interviews are a great example of when this works great. Um, an example uh, down here of where you're sort of, um, how do I say, you know, not let in to the world of one of the great advancements of this camera is lock on autofocus, expand flexible spot. Sounds like another relative of flexible spot. And it is. Problem is, look, it's grayed out. Why is it grayed out? Because you're not allowed to use it. Why are you not allowed to use it? Because it only works in still video like everything else that's grayed out that we're looking at today most of the time. And the reason it's only for still photography, I don't know. Um, I think it's probably technically possible for Sony to add that, hopefully, onto the A7S III. If they do so, then how this works is, if I did select it, you'll see when I do select it, it says not available in movie manual exposure mode. I get it. Um, what that does is it basically sort of in the same way that I don't know if you've used Google Photos or the new version of Adobe uh, Lightroom, where it uses fuzzy logic to register uh, a subject. You identify what the subject is, and then from then on, it sort of falls in love with it and then follows it around. So when you do this sort of thing, um, it's like face detection on steroids, and we'll get to face detection in a minute because that's kind of the killer app for all of this. Um, and what it does is it tracks that in still bracket mode in particular, and then it can shoot, you know, many still photographs at very high megapixels per second and sort of nail focus even in, you know, split seconds. So that's what that mode is about, but this mode is about what we can't use it. Um, so that's all of the varieties of focus areas. You know, I've gone on and on and on and on about this, but it's such a very important part of this camera because it's the main innovation, I think, for filmmakers. Um, even if you think that you're not going to use autofocus, it's really, really great and innovative and revolutionary on this particular um, new product. So if you do end up using any of these modes, my prediction is that for running and gunning, you're going to be in wide, 
and then for interviews you're going to be in some one of the two flexible spots probably expand flexible spot and you're going to mark the place that you want to have in focus in a very controlled and stationary environment so wow that's all the focus area stuff but look there's something vaguely called focus settings so when we drill into that um, we are once again sort of in a different type of interface for being able to move um, our focus point around. We see the front dial going up and down in the uh, Y coordinate, and then we see the back dial being able to go left and right on the uh, X coordinate. <laughs> and then finally, the control wheel on the back is how you change the actual size of the, the flexible spot. With this control dial, I'm able to go up to um, the large size. And then I can further change to some of these other modes, such as expand flexible spot, or I can go back to the generalized wide mode, which clearly doesn't offer us any options. Um, but once again, if we're in zone, we can make those adjustments in that interface. So anyways, that was the focus settings um, air, uh, uh, menu option that's basically an interface for adjusting the focus area parameters um, in a dedicated sort of control environment as opposed to, as we saw before, just simply doing it over here, which is also possible using the new joystick, which I'm doing right now. Okay, so uh, once more still photography, but we move on to page six. And in page six, we are back into the world, in particular, still photography. So, you know, the annoying orange light in the front and... Um, set face priority and so on in autofocus and this i believe is where we can activate a function that is super important when you're doing character-based drama or even documentary where you're flying on a gimbal because if i had this off then it would be agnostic as to what to autofocus on while i'm flying around on a gimbal right okay and then you see towards the bottom left, there's an icon that confirms the fact that face detect, the brackets around the head of the little dude there, it says AF off. Um, that means face detection off, basically. But when I go to the menu and turn it on, what that basically means is that when I am um, shooting a scene that has human faces in view, it's not as simple as saying that the A7R3 will focus on that face because you can have multiple faces. You might not see a full profile of a face. What I think is the most sort of fair and balanced way to describe it is that it sort of adds that fact into the stew of decisions that the fuzzy logic uh, of the product makes in terms of... Um, what to pull in focus and whatnot. So uh, it usually works great uh, because as you have multiple people, it's going to favor the person who's closer to you rather than far away. So in other words, what am I saying here? You see two faces and then one face is closer, one face is farther away. I think it usually favors the one that's closer to you and certainly the one that's uh, more central and you know, God knows it's impossible to um, easily and quickly lay out the billions of algorithms that they use via fuzzy logic to decide on focus. But face detection, um, leaving it on, you can rarely go wrong with it. So I think this was a long about way of saying that leaving face detection on via this menu setting is a pretty damn good idea. Um, and then what frame um, display... Uh, what this parameter does, it's also totally advisable to leave it on, is it draws a thin little white box around faces to basically confirm to you that it has identified a face and now it's in that mode of particularly favoring its focus algorithms on a human face. So these are all really actually surprisingly valuable tools when you're flying on a Steadicam, even looking onto the tiny back screen of the A7R3. You really can see what's in focus and what isn't at the time. Okay, autofocus with shutter, that's very much more of a still photography-centric um, setting, but good to have on. 
Okay, and pre-autofocus here, yeah, all of these things are very stills oriented, so we are basically going to skip through this. And you can see it's even grayed out because of it being only a stills photography centric thing. Okay, let's talk ISO. ISO is a huge issue on this camera. There are brand names in the world of advice dishing when it comes to Sony cameras where um, ISO values in the only mode that matters, which we'll talk about when we get to color profiles, sort of have minimums that run all over the gamut. Sony doesn't seem to have its head together and seems very arbitrary in the minimum ISOs that they set. But while we're talking ISOs, I'm just going to punch into this menu and then the first sort of thing to begin with is this. Sure, we can be in auto mode, right? And then when I'm in auto mode, what you'll notice is that it shows you on the left ISO 800 and then on the right ISO 12,800. What does this mean? It means that that's the range within which I can expect ISO will be. Now look at the screen right now. This is with my lens cap on, but at ISO um, 12,800, the noise floor is crazy high, right? It's like an old static analog television. Of course, obviously. What that means is the volume is turned up without, independent of issues like uh, shutter speed and aperture, the volume is cranked up on the digital video stuff that's being you know, captured by the sensor. So um, when it's down to 800, the noise floor gets less, but it doesn't completely go away. So let's go down to, well, yeah, down to 800 by going here. So if we really punch in on this video, we'll still see noise. Um, and this is a good way of testing that because with the lens cap on, we aren't being distracted by any, you know, elements in the frame composition, but simply a clean slate, right? So what I love about the A7R II is that Sony made the decision when you're in one of the S-Log modes, two or three, you can begin at ISO 800. So what's the big deal? The big deal for me, which pisses me off, is that um, they're all over the place in the ecosystem. The A7S II, I'm sorry, the original A7S um, starts at 3200 and goes up from there. It just keeps getting noisier and noisier from 3200. So these would all be grayed out on the A7S. At 1600, that's the minimum ISO on the A7S II. So here's the first proof of Sony's illogic and Sony's arbitrariness. The A7S II is far more light sensitive than the A7R III and II. So why is the A7R III allowed to start at 800 being less light sensitive? And why is the A7R are, I'm sorry, the A7S II needing to start at 1600. Now it is true, ISO numbers are not apples to apples. They are going to vary for each camera. It's not like the brightness level of 1600 on one camera looks the same as another. But the noise floors speak for themselves. And this is where I just find all of this very problematic. Um, the other proof of the arbitrariness is that the FS started out at a minimum 3200 ISO upon its launch. And then when people complained about that having a high noise floor, they said, hey, Sony, um, this sucks. Could we go down a little more? Could we be eligible to start at a lower ISO when we're shooting in log, which is, again, the only professional video format you want to shoot in? They issued a firmware update to at least make it go to 2000. And again, the noise floor here is going to be different than on the FS7, but rather similar because these are both, um, you know, um, similar generation processors, sensors, and so on. Bottom line is it's all over the place. Um, you're, I mean, this, the goal of God knows, God forbid this video wouldn't teach about the fundamentals of cinematography, and you probably know them already anyways, but obviously you want to keep the ISO always as low as possible.
So here we are at ISO 800. That's the minimum. I think it's great. ISO 800, I can work with that. I can't work with it at 3200 on an A7S. It's pretty noisy. So the trade-offs of shooting in log uh, mean that there are certain ISOs you can't go down into. Now, why is this all grayed out? Because if you were in stills mode or if you were in a non-log color profile, you'd begin to start using some of these uh, lower ISOs um, and reduce your noise floor. But log is different. Now, there's a reason why log profiles need to start higher than something crazy low like 100. I mean, the GH4 starts at 400. Again, different sensor, not apples to apples, but it starts pretty low. Um, we start here at 800 because if we started any lower than that, the whole point of a log curve would be violated. A log curve is designed to um, brighten things up um, at the native ISO level, enough so so that it can apply a curve and raise the shadows and reduce the highlights. And then we expand those back in post during color correction. It's not an optional step, mandatory step. So totally true, you need a minimum ISO just as a matter of, of using uh, log curves in the color profiles as compared to non using non-log color profile curves. But I don't know, last breath of rant is Sony's got to figure this out and be a little friendlier to us because there are trade-offs we'd like to make, especially when we have um, constricted light conditions, unpredictable environments, uncontrolled environments. I'd love to be able to push this down even further, particularly on something like the A7S II, which is the most light-sensitive video camera on the market with log profiles where it's stuck at 1600 and I'd rather go down farther. Okay, enough ranting, but we now we know. Uh, when we go back to um, metering mode and things like this, um, metering mode being multi or one thing or another um, is only relevant to the extent that you have ISO set to something other than a fixed ISO. Where my snobbery, where anybody's snobbery should completely stay solid, um, I was mentioning before, autofocus is an evolving thing where now the manual snobs say, okay, fine, maybe autofocus can work sometimes, depending on circumstances. I don't think we'll ever be in the world where you want to be in auto mode for ISO. So there are tools that Sony gives you to set limits on how much, how high the auto ISO can go, um, what type of metering there is. But what I'd advise is that these things stay irrelevant to you because you fixed the ISO at some amount. Okay? Same here. Flash is very irrelevant to video. Here we are at white balance. Um, when it comes to choosing between the varieties of white balance modes, um, one thing to note that has been in these Sony A7 series and other cameras for a while is the ability to dial into a very specific uh, Kelvin value. So I kind of did that wrong when I did that way. But when you go there, you press to the right. And then by going to the right, you're presented with an interface where you can choose a specific value. So by choosing a specific value, you might stand a chance um, matching uh, by number other cameras on a multi-cam shoot. This is where I find this especially valuable. The problem is, is that different sensors have different color characteristics. So, for example, one time I thought I nailed it when I selected 5100 Kelvin, but I was shooting with a Blackmagic camera, and when I set that also to precisely 5100 Kelvin, um, they still didn't match. So... Um, every camera has unique color characteristics, to be honest. If I might sort of, you know, kind of bag on Sony a little bit, I think they have some of the worst color uh, on the market. I think Canon and Blackmagic in particular are far more color accurate, color rich, and everything. Um, so there's a limit to this function, and the only reason I thought I'd mention it here is because um, it's kind of a cautionary tale be wary of using this um, set Kelvin value. You might have to tweak it anyway relative to the other cameras in your shoot. So enough on that. Um, finally, they seem to have fixed the ability to set from a white card, which has had a painful evolution in the A7 line for video mode.
All right. Uh, another hugely important theme when we talk about shooting video, definitely not this picture effect is all about these goofy toy and all this still photography, um, Instagrammy stuff. But when we talk about picture profile, I still think it's a little goofy that Sony uses this PP one through now, what is it? 10, I think it's nine on the a seven S two where that's not particularly descriptive, right? So you really have to drill into these. It turns out that I think um, there's a consistency in the sense that picture profile 9 or nine, 8 and 9 on the A7R 3 I think matches the A7S 2's uh, uh, PP8 and PP9. That's where I live. So... Uh, one spec change, no need to recover this ground, um, but most other reviews mention that one of the feature additions of the A7R3 is the addition of S-Log3. So let's drill into PP8, which contains the profile for S-Log3, and the way you do that is not, as I always instinctively do with the center button, but rather with that little right arrow. So you go right arrow, you can see there it is, S-Log3. And S-Log3 is generally preferable to S-Log2. Why? I would argue for two primary reasons. First is S-Log3 is more universal. So that is to say, if you have a mixed camera setup or looking forward to the future, if you're going to use this footage blending with other more advanced cameras in the future, S-Log3 is more, if you will, neutral, less proprietary to Sony. Um, I would say it's closer to the uh, Airy Alexa's um, log color profile. It's closer and easier to match with Blackmagic's film mode, which is their log color profile. And finally, with Canon's um, C-Log, I think it's a closer match than S-Log 2. There are a lot of filmmakers, and I found even the majority of filmmakers, who kind of nerd out on the differences between S-Log 2 and S-Log 3. They argue that S-Log 3 is uh, um, sort of a dead end, for one reason that I totally agree with, and that is that S-Log3 is the least forgiving to the Achilles heel of the uh, whole S-Log world. I'm sorry, not the S-Log world inherently, but of these A7 cameras that they shoot in 8-bit. So when we're back at, I think it's going to be 7. We're in S-Log2, right? You can see S-Log2 there, and then S-Gamut, which we'll get to in a second. So as between S-Log2 and S-Log3, let's say just the bottom line is that there's banding um, very badly that's revealed all the more in S-Log3. Um, it looks awful, and it makes it look like a really cheap camera, and you would never want to deliver it to anyone on a professional level. Um, so there's one attitude where you can say, I take the good with the bad, right? And you uh, you just say, yeah, maybe that'll show up sometimes, but I'm also getting these other qualities. The second main quality, besides the kind of compatibility going forward plus between other cameras issue about S-Log3, is that S-Log3 is simply has more dynamic range. That's a specification reality. Um, it is able to um, be graded at a much greater level and with much more precision than S-Log2. Um, it's more of a clean slate. Like I said, it's more of a neutral, uh, flat color profile. Um, it's more sophisticated. It's a higher number. I mean, there's just lots of reasons why I sort of bit the bullet and I'm sticking with the latest Sony S-Log3. I sort of, frankly, recommend it to you, too. Um, there are ways around, by the way, um, the, the sky issues, for example, with those gradations. We won't get into that now, but you can stay in S-Log3 and avoid those um, effects. Um, the main way to avoid that is for Sony to finally, like the Panasonic GH5 and now 5S, is to add 10-bit recording capability. They have no choice at this point, and they have to. The A7S 3 is all but expected to have 10-bit, which would especially nudge us into sticking with S-Log3. Okay, and then wrapping up this whole thing of color profiles, um, besides briefly mentioning, yeah, okay, fine. If you are a video shooter... There are arguments about using, you know, the regular non-log color profiles, which include most particularly, that's ITU 709 is like regular video, right? 
um, w but without any goofy kind of um, other revisions to the color profile. Then we get to Cine 1, which is a favorite of people who are grumpy about, you know, the way that log color behaves and the noise floor in log and stuff like that. Um, Cine 2. But I think a lot of that also has to do with the argument that sometimes you're under tight deadlines and you don't have time to go through a color correction phase because, yeah, totally, you can't deliver, um, you can't hand over an SD card to somebody and say, okay, here's my video. If it's in log format, they're still going to have to pass through it and convert it to um, Rec. 709, which is standard, you know, punchy, normal um, color space. The last decision you make, though, if you do go with um, S log three, is as between this S gamut three dot cine mode and the other mode that's just called S dash gamut three. Which one do you choose? I don't know. I mean, I definitely did my own comparisons, and I chose cine because I see myself as doing quote cinematic stuff. That was a stupid reason. But I did like the way S gamut 3 dot cine looked better than just S gamut, and there are many other parameters here that Sony doesn't even advise that you change. One of the reasons that it's unadvisable to change any of these parameters from their defaults is that what are most of us going to do? We're going to load up color profiles that convert to Rec. 709 with certain quote looks. My favorite still being Film Convert, even though they're a company that's sort of infuriating, infuriatingly slow and unresponsive. But Film Convert still kind of owns the space of converting from these log picture profiles into something that looks, you know, conservatively cinematic. So enough on picture profiles. I am kind of skipping this 10 because 10 is the other new addition. Notice how cool, how, how amazingly, richly pure black the screen got. That's because we're in this new... Um, BT.2020 is HDR. That's the industry sort of, you know, confusingly um, unfriendly term for HDR. And in HDR, it's just continuing to expand the color space, um, giving us more latitude, headroom in the top end and in the bottom end. The, the darkest darks are darker, the brightest brights are brighter. Um, the problem with this is, I, th I would just say, relevance to workflows today. We're not in the HDR world yet. You know, how many people are equipped to watch HDR and so on and so on. So kind of like the world's not ready for that. So bottom line, at least my personal recommendation for what it's worth, S-Log3, S-Gamut3 dot Cine. Oh my God, are we at the end of almost we won't need to go through all of this um, some of these things are even relevant in video mode when it comes to focus magnifier but um, peaking setting is cer certainly important um, I've been stunned sometimes I run into professional shooters who kind of manual focus but they're like I don't like peaking I don't want it I don't need it I just don't get it peaking is a super valuable um, way of achieving correct focus so you kind of can't live without it once you start using it so make sure it's on right and then when it is on um, and of course it's only on by the way obviously you only see the colored sparkles when you're in manual focus mode never while you're in autofocus mode um, the peaking level being on high I found to be a totally intelligent choice you know lowering the amount of peaking so that you can enjoy what you see on your monitor is sort of a dumb idea because your goal while you're watching your content as a shooter is not to see a faithful representation of what you're shooting. It's to nail issues like exposure and focus. So, you know, let that sparkle go crazy, right? And then pick a color as opposed to white that really is obvious that it's peaking. Oh my God. Last page of page one. Last page of tab one is once again, not especially video relevant. And let's move on. Tab two. Um, so... Moving on to tab two, we are presented with quite a few more video options. And here, um, I'm not going to dare take us out of this because it'll shut down my <laughs> output that is currently outputting in HD. Although, no, actually, it maybe won't. 
the bottom line there is that you can't output the um, the live view of the A7R3 via the HDMI port in 4K. You can only do it in HD. So what we can do here is we can select between the varieties of XAVCS codecs and um, AVC HD. So why anyone would ever choose this mode is a super veteran old school reason that I would never walk down. Um, it might be because you have to blend footage with others or something. I don't know. But um, I cannot think of any reason why you would want to shoot in anything other than XAVC S4K. Can we just let that be? Yeah. And then once you are in that mode, we would be able to see the uh, different record settings um, relevant to 4K. What we have here in 1080p XAVCS is even more uh, modes that go up to 120p. So one thing to settle right off the bat is that when you shoot in um, high frame rates for the usually the objective of being able in post-production to slow it down and then have slow motion footage that's smooth, the reason you, uh, whenever you shoot that way, you you aren't going to get 4K footage out of it. It's not true 4K. It's going to be 1080p or less. And the faster it gets, the worse the resolution gets. When we know that our target is 120 frames per second, you, in another section of these menus that we'll get to, you have the choice of being able to actually lay down the video into your camera um, in slow motion so that when you play it back as a video file, it's literally in slow motion. So you really should know by now that the way to do this, if your target is 120p, 120 frames per second anyways, is to select the record setting in 1080p for 120p at the highest bit rate of 100 megabits per second. And then once you do that, when you bring it into your timeline, it'll play back in real time. It won't look slow motion when, you're lo when you've loaded it up into Premiere or Final Cut or whatever. But then what you do is you, you know, in the case of Premiere, you right click on it, you go to speed slash duration dot dot dot, and then you change that value to, let's say, one quarter as slow, not four times as fast. When you have it set to 25% speed playback, um, you'll find that even that in normal circumstances it would jitter, but here it's buttery smooth. So this sets us up for this next menu setting, which is the other way of going about it that I'm sort of recommending against, and that's this called S, so-called S and Q settings. Um, I've always hated the use of those two letters that are hard to remember. It dates back to the Sony NEX FS100 that had a little dedicated button for this. But when you go there, Sure enough, there you are. You can see it says record setting 30p and then frame rate 120 frames per second. So um, S and Q is a way of basically storing your footage onto your memory card ready to go, if you will, in the fashion terminology, ready to wear without having to do any tailoring in post-production. Um, you would definitely want to use that if you don't want to waste a lot of card space and you want to shoot at something like, whoops, let me get on here, something like one frame per second, that's how you do fast motion, right? So you don't want to shoot like an hour of 30 frames per second and then speed it up. That would be dumb because it would waste a lot of disk space. And then you couldn't do cool things like apply um, a slow shutter speed to get motion blur between the one frames per second. Um, so that's what S and Q is really for. So Bottom line, in sum, only use S and Q for um, uh, fast motion where you want to go down to really low frame rates. Where you want to be, though, for um, slow motion cinematography is not in S and Q mode, but rather in this record mode that ups the frame rate to 120. And then from there, you can even go lower than 25% and the 120p example. Um, or in a 24p timeline even lower than that, but you can go even farther down than that if you use really cool tools like Premiere's Optical Flow, and you'll find that with this starting point, you can even go down to 10% speed, and it still looks pretty damn good. So these are the tips and tricks on avoiding uh, or really making your slow motion footage look as best as possible.
by ironically not using the mode that's designed for slow motion. Okay, let me go back to 30p. But at that, um, proxy recording is kind of cool. That's an ability to make a sidecar sort of video file of what you're shooting um, that you might, for example, be able to um, import into a laptop. The reason why I think this mode's kind of dumb is because video editing applications, at least Adobe, has evolved to the point where um, kind of further downstream you can make these proxy decisions because when you import um, f camera files into Adobe Premiere, you can actually toggle on a mode that automatically creates proxy files pretty rapidly, actually, in the background that you can then bring with you on the road on a lower kind of... Um, muscled laps, laptop and then when you come back to your big desktop it'll automatically hook back into the original files so in terms of file space management it might actually ironically be a worse idea to create proxy files at the acquisition stage here but save that for later so that you can kind of temporarily create proxy files in a dedicated junk folder and then when you're done with the proxy files, just delete them and not have them be part of your camera acquisition workflow. Okay, page two. Here we have some of the um, more still photography centric things. We could adjust these. We won't get into this too much here. This is more of the, um, the idea of how responsive is the autofocus. Um, Putting it on standard, again, proved to be better for me in this regard. But um, these are things that I think no one could really teach you about because um, everybody shoots different types of material. So I would put a bookmark on this to basically try each of the different modes and then see what works best for you. It's worth the investment of time and experimentation. Um, here you can actually toggle off auto record audio recording. Don't know why you'd want to do that. But setting the audio record level, um, I'm just going to kind of sneak in kind of a little kind of words of wisdom, if you will, advice over years I've learned. If you have a microphone that has a gain control on it, so let's take, for example, some of the most popular ones like the Rode video mic, right? Pretty standard, industry standard at this kind of prosumer level camera accessory. There's a switch on the back where you can do a mic boost that goes between, I think it's, there's like a negative something db then a zero db then a 20 db something like that um you certainly never want to be at the lowest setting of that mic boost but rather at least the next level up and then maybe um, the ne next level up higher than that because the audio preamps in the a7 series of cameras they're certainly not xlr inputs are they and they're um the the impedance of the of the microphone and line inputs is not quote pro audio. So that means that your preamps are noisier and they're more vulnerable the higher you go with the gain here, right? So did you notice that the default was at like 25? So when you buy the camera from Sony and you fire it up, it's gonna choose an audio record level that's pretty high. But if you bring it down to a pretty low number, and honestly, I average around 10 um, on the A7R 3 and then you hook a mic in that can jack up the volume to deliver at the input stage already fairly high volume levels. That usually is going to give you a lower noise floor than if you raise the preamp level inside the camera. So that's just a little advice there on managing your audio recording levels. And this is telling you, yeah, do I want to see that on the viewfinder? Totally. Again, this goes to the idea, and I just find it kind of funny. I think it's funny how filmmakers sometimes want to see a clean viewfinder as if it's so difficult to compose their shots and where to locate things in the frame. You want to have the maximum information on the frame. So I leave all of these little icons on, including, again, the VU meters, if you will, old school way of saying the audio meters that bounce up and down. It's a way of verifying that the audio is still reaching you. Sometimes cables just suddenly stop working and you wouldn't know that they suddenly stopped working if you didn't see the little lights dancing around. Yeah. Okay. Page three. Um, 
wind noise reduction. I mean, that's another sort of thing you can do in post anyway. Um, so you wouldn't want to burn that into your SD card um, uh, onto the actual camera footage um, and make the decision now rather than saving that decision for later. Basically, it's doing a few things, but it's mainly sort of, um, it's like a high pass filter. It's only allowing higher frequencies to pass because lower frequencies tend to be the place where um, wind rumble is the most disruptive to your uh, video footage. Marker settings um, is pretty hipster for me, so that's me being me or me expressing my preferences. This is all about, you know, if you're that pretentious person who um, thinks that even though you're shooting on video and even though you're making, let's say, even like a simple social issue documentary, that for some reason you're the cool person who shoots in what's called cinema scope aspect ratio, and then we're even on widescreen television sets, you know, the bars at the top and the bottom. So that's the sort of highfalutin cinema auteur aspect ratio. Some people think it's so great to be able to see that. Okay, I mean, if you think so, awesome. And if you think that it helps you see what it's doing is it's cropping the top and the bottom and only showing the view of the actual relevant aspect ratio. So I don't go there. I'm all about 16 by 9. It's what fills up. A television set we're all video filmmakers today um, it also lets you though choose other modes like four by three aspect ratio I don't know if you're shooting in that aspect ratio and you really want to frame things correctly yeah it's true you could spare yourself having content that is eventually going to get cropped out so these are relevant concerns to some people and then when it comes to these other things, there's something else that's kind of a little goofy about some of these marker settings because they are duplicated on the next page or another page that we'll see in a moment with regards to things like the rule of thirds, a grid of that nature. So we'll skip that for now. Um, movie with shutter, power link. These are things that are bonus features um, about, you know, one thing that is a review -y type topic is that, yes, Sony has finally, after years of stubbornness, relocated the video recording button that begins video recording to an actual location where you won't accidentally hit it and what's more it's actually kind of hard to activate you have to push you know nicely hard to be able to start video recording and stop video recording it used to be something that you could accidentally activate because it was very near to your palm while you were holding the camera now it's more centered just to the right of the viewfinder um, movie with shutter has to do with whether or not um, you know how the shutter button interacts with that process but the bottom line is you're using the official new highly improved shutter button now which is right below right to the right of the viewfinder okay um this has to do with still stuff um release without lens release without card these are all about when you use um manual non-sony lenses that aren't Sony proprietary that don't have metadata electrical contacts, you know, are you making that legal, if you will? So we always leave those on, right? Enable the release mode. Steady shot. Um, why would you want this off? This is another kind of pet peeve of mine. People who say, for example, that steady shot being on while you're on a tripod is somehow going to ruin everything. Yeah, it might drift a little bit at the end of a movement. But that's better than the jitters that any camera operator tends to often introduce anyways when they're even using a tripod. And then certainly when you're shooting handheld, why the hell would you not want to have steady shot on? Like, it's just infuriating when we see the hipster footage. Again, Vimeo staff picks, right? That are just nauseatingly jittery. Um, so, okay, foregone conclusion, obvious. What's a little more complicated is when we get into these steady shot settings... Uh, why you would not want to have it on audio is sometimes interesting. Um, if you put on a non Sony native lens, then if there's no metadata contacts that communicate back what the precise lens focal length is, you need to be manually telling the Sony a seven R three what your lens is. So this is really a prime lens um, centric function. In fact, steady shot um, with the in-body image stabilization really only works if you have a fixed focal length or if you're on a zoom lens, if you're going to stay at, let's say, 24 millimeters. 
So you have to go in here and do that for steady shot to work according to its optimized uh, algorithms. So um, that's that. But you run the risk by leaving it in manual mode of then putting on a steady shot um, compatible Sony native lens and then locking it at the 24 millimeter focal length, which will ruin your steady shot capability. So you basically leave it on auto and then you tinker with the focal length only if you put on a non Sony native lens or E mount lens that's designed with metadata contacts. So again, word of warning, there are E mount native lenses, not adapted Canon or Nikon lenses, but literally Sony E mount native ish lenses that don't have contacts, and the greatest example being a lot of these cinema lenses, such as Rokinon E-mount lenses, you still have to go in there and manually tell it what the focal length is if you hook on one of those totally manual lenses. Okay. And then zoom, um, this is the uh, digital zoom in most cases. There is this clear image zoom function, and I'm totally sold on it. I think it's kind of awesome. Optical zoom only means um, that if you have a zoom that has um, a zoom capability on it, it can be electronically controlled. So I have this great cinema lens by Sony that goes from 28 to 135 millimeters, and it's a power zoom lens. So yeah, you can control that on the camera side via, you know, for example, through the multi-interface. You can hook a remote controller in and so on. Um, if you say digital zoom only, then... You can see how we get to a point where it exceeds clear image zoom and becomes just sort of digital zoom all on its lonesome. And maybe the theme here that keeps it simple is this is where you're really in trouble. This is where your image is really starting to suck. Um, once you're below this line, though, in, in um, the clear, what's it called? What is it called again? Clear image zoom. The line that tells you you're in clear image zoom mean clear image zoom means that even though you're sort of digitally magnifying parts of the sensor, um, it's using what Sony secretly calls a sort of fuzzy logic to improve the resolution and r kind of preserve your full 4K resolution in video. Um, but it's also using some sort of algorithms about, I don't know, they, they call it object detection. Who knows whether they're lying or not. But it is a funky algorithm that, that sort of surprisingly seems to simulate a real optical zoom in many cases. I leave clear image zoom on, but I turn off digital zoom. So by selecting this mode, I prevent the ability from going into that dangerous digital zoom mode that's going past the top end of clear image zoom where the image really starts deteriorating. Page six, um, display button, what does it do? Finder frame rate, that's um, the refresh rate of the, the, the viewfinder. Zebra setting super important, isn't it? So when we turn that on, I'm gonna totally defer to these sort of cranky debates. God, I'm not going to name names, but a lot of sort of S-log disciples have varying views on what the right at zebra level is. I'm pretty old school when it comes to zebras. Um, I'm very highlight centric. I figure I can deal with my midtones later since I color correct pretty heavily everything that I do. And so I'm basically concerned about not blowing out my highlights. So if I'm worried about not blowing out my highlights, I'm going to set my zebras at 95 and then I'm going to give myself a little wiggle room. But my, my goal is to not let the highlights blow out as opposed to setting the zebras to 70, which is what a lot of people do. Whoops. Because 70 traditionally is the zone where midtones are. And then what you do is you make sure, or just higher than that, or just maybe lower than that. But the bottom line is that if you set them to 70, then the practice would be you make sure that the, let's say the human face isn't getting the zebras, but everything else above the brightness of the human face is. But again, if you're more highlight paranoid, then you're going to want to go just below kind of blowouts, right? So that's my practice, but a choice you have to make on your own. But don't leave zebras, zebras off. I think it's totally a tool that's there for you to use. And, and, and 
you know, highlights like like an audio where clipping is the Achilles heel that can ruin an entire shoot. I think blow, blown out highlights can also completely ruin a shoot too. So it's it's one of the most critical sort of um, um, tools, monitoring tools that you have in this camera. Um, I was saying earlier about this um, guide. Where was that? It was a while ago, wasn't it? Anyways, we had a, we had a, oh, there it was, marker display. So sort of redundant with marker display, but far more useful is this grid line setting. And there we have the rule of thirds grid. Definitely another sort of off topic thing that I could meander into is about this rule of thirds. There are people who love saying that the rule of thirds is like an evil rule that only is taught in, in conservative film schools and that we've gotten, we've grown out of it. I mean, bullshit. You got to call bullshit on that because rule of thirds still governs, controls, informs, I don't know, 75% or more of everything that you shoot. It's the way human beings move their eyes. It's the way audiences most ideally react with images. So um, the rule of thirds grid is just a no-brainer to have on. And um, so while you can't see it right now, um, this is the thing that activates that when you're fully shooting video and skip. Okay. I promise you the pace is picking up here. I have no idea if anybody by this by now is watching this, but, uh, this is the, maybe the most thorough guide on YouTube to the a seven R three menus. In fact, I'm almost kind of sure of it. Who else would be this crazy? All right. Um, we are at the still photography tail end of, of uh, tab two. And when it comes to custom keys, I'm going to kind of skip that because of the fact that um, this has to do with you customizing your A7R 3 to whatever you prefer. What is great, though, this has become sort of increasingly less relevant the more that Sony improves their camera bodies because as the A7 series continues to add more buttons, Sony's just sort of, you know, assigning the most useful functions to the ever increasing number of buttons, right? So now there's things like a dedicated, you know, bracket, I'm sorry, a dedicated um, autofocus toggle button. Um, there's a dedicated uh, auto exposure button. There's the new um, joystick in the back, which is really a thumb pad. Um, there's C1, C2, C3. These are all customizable and more. So um, you'll need to learn how to use these functions. But then I think the only thing I meant to say in all of this is kind of don't go too crazy with it because it goes back to that thing of that star menu that I was talking about earlier. You know, you can customize so much. You can fall in love so much that you'll never be able to fall in love with another camera again. And by that, I mean you'll sort of get wedded to a button layout that may become irrelevant one year from now when you get the next generation camera, right? So I wouldn't start with the sort of arrogance of I will customize everything. I'd first learn the way that Sony um, assigned things and then see if you disagree with any of those decisions and then only change the things that you disagree with. How about that? So that's what that's all about. Oh my God, last page. We're totally speeding up now because here we have um, some things that are generally not relevant to movie mode. Besides this, I mean, this is a no-brainer to leave off. Audio signals is basically the camera beeping every time you do many functions. And the reality is, is that um, sometimes, especially if you're doing second audio, like external audio, it'll pick up on your camera going bleepity bleep when you start recording, stop recording, X, Y, Z function. Uh, but sometimes you need those extra moments as cushion in your sound mix, in your post-production editing workflow and so on. So to have the camera be announcing itself um, in a filmmaking environment is sort of dumb because sound is, is happening, right? Doesn't uh, need any competition from your camera. So now that I move forward, the way these tabs work is that if you were in a tab and you're on the last page, if you go forward to the next page, you move to the next tab. That's what's happening here. Network, I'm going to skip mostly besides saying that um, one thing that 
is changed in the A7R3 that's sort of pissing a lot of people off. I'm not sure what of what to make of it, but it tentatively feels wrong. Sony removed Play Memories app compatibility. So it used to live somewhere around here where you would be able to install sort of mini applets in A7 series cameras that would do things like time lapse. So, bad news. The A7R3 is incapable of shooting time lapse um, in still mode, for example, still photography mode, which is the best way to get high quality time lapses. This is a huge problem for people. Literally, you have to use an intervalometer, which is an external trigger that's almost like a robot pressing down on the shutter button, but doing so through um, sort of in remote control means. So that was one example of a Play Memories app. There were other ones, too, that did things like, I don't know, you know, um, is it Tiny Planet is what they call it? Like when they change the focus on certain sort of planes of an image composition? Lots of little things like that. So it's gone now. It used to be sort of accessible under this tab, customizable under this tab. So there's only two pages here, and what's left in the network capability is the ability to send pictures from your camera to the internet and to send them to a connected smartphone or tablet device, but also to control the camera through those means. Um, and then just one last kind of rant thing to add here is that Sony still remains inexplicably and stupidly stubborn about completely disallowing the ability to control focus from a remote device. I don't know what they're worried about, what they're paranoid about. I think third-party manufacturers would love to be able to control the focus of Sony cameras. I'm thinking in particular of something like the Xeon Crane 2, which has a focus knob on it. Sony refuses to open up their API to allow anybody not, not least Sony themselves through their Play Memories app to be able to control focus. But how cool would it be to be able to hold a tablet, either a remote operator or yourself, and just touch the portion of the screen that's being presented to you and then just have it rack focus over to that thing that you have just touched on the screen. You're able to do that on the back panel of the A7R 3 which is a new innovation that wasn't previously available. Um, but even then, it's not a good interface, and it's a tiny screen, and it's not remote. So one of these days, Sony might give up its sort of hierarchical, culturally command and control problems and start enabling those highly demanded features. Okay, so now we've moved to the next tab of playback. Once again, stuff that kind of aren't of any value to explain in this... Um, in this um, sort of menu tutorial slash review, besides the fact that really the only big difference is that you can choose between the slots, right? Because this camera is the first in the A7 line to have the ability to install two different SD cards. Okay, setup we'll spend a little time on, but not much. First, this is a super killer app. Um, the first Sony cameras that had log did not include this, and it was awful. Um, this basically makes you see what your S-log two or three footage will look like given the most conservative grade slash translation to Rec. 709, which is to say standard video, i.e. the types of video color profiles that you see on standard television. Um, standard video, right? Because log is sort of difficult to assess things like exposure and color and white balance and things like this when you don't convert it on the fly to what it should look like in the end, right? Because log again is altering the image to not make it look right so as to ideally store it in a way that doesn't um, push the camera too far past its limits and then you unpack it again in post-production. So by setting it to off you only see through the viewfinder that very milky, flat, unable, uh, uh, difficult to assess live view of camera footage. By putting it to auto, what that means is, is that to the extent that you have it set to S-Log2, it'll convert it to Rec. 709. To the extent that you have it on S-Log3, it'll convert it to Rec. 709 only 
on the viewfinder and and on the back uh, monitor. So that said, what it doesn't do is it doesn't burn it into the footage because what's the point of that, right? Because you'd just be converting it back to the thing that presents problems in storage. So um, by leaving this on, you have nothing to lose. Um, by leaving it on auto, it means that whenever you're in log mode, it'll make an attempt to convert it to something that looks, that approximates what the most conservative color grade would look like. By leaving it off, you have a harder time being able to judge how the footage will look in the end and whether you're getting color right, exposure right, and so on. These are aside from highlights issues uh, that, that zebras clue us into. Okay, so that was gamma assist. This is the speaker control for the internal speaker on the uh, A7R three, which I call the emergency mode, right? You don't have headphones, but you just want to at least see that you got sound. Um, so yeah, little things like this. Oh my God. So this could be another five minute speech, but it's a mere 10 seconds. Sony has quote, graciously added the ability to push to the overheating limits. Um, the camera what all of these 4k sony cameras have always failed to do is to manage heat well we just didn't have the time nor do we really want to test the overheating issue because uh, we just were super busy but max you went through all the trouble to do that and we really appreciate it so we're going to ask you max on the a6300 was there any overheating you have to talk in the mic we only brought one no perfect and uh did you try that all the different frame rates yes and there's still no overheating no Perfect, there you have it. So Max Uriev has confirmed there's no overheating in the A6300. So uh, don't worry about that, guys. A fantastic, fantastic thing for the video capabilities. Max, thank you very much. You're welcome. No. You're welcome. They tried to deny it at first that it was a problem, and then there was a big fiasco, and finally they owned up to it. They issued firmware updates in two times in a row, actually, where they finally kind of came around to admitting that their cameras were shutting down way too soon when shooting in 4K off batteries. And they let you turn it on high, but then they, the, the, the legal team hired by Sony, basically a tower full of lawyers, made sure that you read this sort of terms and conditions agreement where you consent to potentially not only ruining your camera, but maybe even like, you know, burning your hands. What's the bottom line on this? Hell yeah, like turn it on high all the time. Like screw Sony. Like they shouldn't have even let it overheat to begin with. And there has not been a single example of the, I don't know, millions or at least hundreds of thousands of these that have been sold of a camera failing because it overheated so much while still recording that even in the high mode, it like just completely crapped out and exploded in somebody's face or for that matter stopped working. So there's no risk at all turning it on to high. Even so, I have been in, let's say, for example, you know, the high desert of Nevada shooting a documentary when, yes, I had it in high mode. And what happened? It totally shut down. So it still does overheat and it still does shut down when it overheats. Um, but when it shut down in high mode on me, uh, the camera wasn't destroyed. So high mode is the way to go. This lets you, this is the world camera selector in, in effect. And what this lets you do is simply um, turn it into a 50 hertz, 50 frames per second. Um, I'm sorry, 25p slash 50p reference European most of the time uh, camera versus NTSC. But when you do change it, I'm not going to do it here. It'll have to, as it predicts here, reboot the camera to completely change the camera into that. It's sort of like going through customs. <laughs> Cleaning mode. Um, yeah, you know this, right? So this is about when you uh, when you have manageable but not gooey, smudgy, spit, saliva stuff on your camera sensor that was usually the result of it creeping in while you were changing lenses. By activating this, um, it... I'm not going to do it because it might shut this down and restart or whatever, but it basically shakes it um, at a very high vibration rate, believing that it might make the particles kind of fall off the sensor. Um, but it totally doesn't get rid of smudge marks. I don't know. Why am I talking about this at length in the menu? Because you can really screw yourself by trying to clean your own sensor if you really don't know what you're doing. The There are some ripoffs on the market 
but you cannot do it with even a lint-free cloth. It's there for most of the things that cause damage on sensor, even temporarily. It's like when you spit because you talk. Saliva is not going to come off um, through a lint-free cloth on any camera sensor, and you need those um, dedicated uh, sensor swabs combined with a specific fluid design for that. And they tend to run at a minimum at least 10 bucks on eBay, but for sure 20, 30, 40 dollars. Make sure you're doing that and not using your eyeglass, you know, cloth and cleaner because you'll ruin your camera forever. Or what Sony would love for you to do because it makes them a lot of money is just like pay a fortune and send it into them, but whatever. Touch operation, that has to do with the autofocus capabilities when you use the touchscreen on the back. Disappointingly, the A7R3 uses the touchscreen capability of the back monitor for only focus. Even for tedious things like typing in on the on-screen keyboard, you can't use the touchscreen. So we have to expect that hopefully they'll add that capability. The GH4 and the GH5, for example, uses the back touchscreen of those cameras for a whole variety of things. So when we're talking the A7R 3 we're only in the universe of being able to click and drag focus points to different locations. That is the whole shebang when it comes to touch operation, so pretty disappointing. That's more of that. Touchpad, touchpad. This has to do with time code. I don't know who uses that anymore. Very few people. So because, right, what, what are we in now? We're in the world of Pluralize from Red Giant Software for complex projects, or Premiere for that matter. You can just kind of, you know, right click on two clips and tell it to auto sync them based on audio and then it does it all. So time code, don't know how relevant that is. Remote control, when you turn this on, kind of a little known secret for people who shoot like events in particular, is that you can get these cheap, like there's a Fotka device that's 10 bucks. There's on the USB, micro USB port, you can plug one of these cheap remote control devices into the USB, micro USB port. And then by turning this on, it just makes it eligible for that. I don't know why you turn want to turn it off. Basically, what it says is if you do have one such micro USB um, accessory device plugged in, it can control about four things. It controls start, stop. It controls shutter of still photography. And then it has a up and down on uh, zooming. That even works, by the way, for the clear image zoom. So even if you don't have a power zoom lens attached, if you have a prime lens attached, by using this remote control device, you can have a dedicated thing. For example, you can strap it onto the handle of a tripod so that while you're using your hand to move the tripod around, you can be moving the focal length in and out through this remote accessory device. HDMI settings, that, that's literally relevant right now to what I'm doing because what I'm doing is I'm not outputting 4K, I'm outputting 1080p. These are the varieties of settings that sort of you know control those output issues. Um, a lot of them are irrelevant, particularly time code. Um, some of them have to do with um, between 24p, 60p. These are things that will vary based on your use cases, but not hard to figure out. Um, where it becomes relevant is I think on the next page here where you say 4k output select. And there, um, you can say uh, record to the memory card as well as outputting 4K to HDMI or just HDMI only with restrictions to 30P and 24P. I think that's a new feature because um, it used to be that you could only do one or the other. So it's a nice thing to have. Um, we can speed through these two because this has to do with the fact that if you've connected via USB, this actually lets you select between uh, a few of the options and by having it on auto for example I can make it eligible for that remote control via USB to happen like the or I can always force it to only become sort of an external drive when I've connected via USB so I've kind of sort of gone off topic there because USB power supply is really the setting where also you can say do I want to receive um, power via USB when I have it plugged in that way. So, oops, those th those two settings basically work together to make decisions about what happens when you plug USB cables into this device. PC Remote actually is 
um, in the nature of using a, a PC application um, to control the camera. And um, that usually is more in a studio environment where you've got um, a PC set up to actually acquire the images, view them on a large monitor in real time. You have clients looking over your shoulder, blah, blah, blah. It's not relevant to most filmmakers. And yeah, the only thing that comes to mind, these are definitely all related to video too, but the only thing that comes to mind that's worth mentioning here is that you're set to series and then you can reset it. This is pretty important and it's another kind of pet peeve um, for a lot of Sony video users is that the way that Sony names video files is extremely simplistic and they don't give you the ability to make it any more complicated. You've noticed that it puts it in a directory called clip inside of private, um, inside of MP4 root and all this stuff. There's these layers of directories that are pretty useless because you don't need the surrounding metadata for video. You just need the actual file. And what the files do is they count up from C 001.mp4 and then they just keep counting up over the life of the camera. So even as you take a lithium battery out of the camera, um, there is a further little embedded internal lithium battery that you can't remove that does keep track of this ever increasing uh, file number series. So that means that if you ended a shoot, filled up a card and it went to C275.mp4, that the next time you kind of, you know, recharge the battery, put it back into the camera, you've wiped out the card, put in a new card, whatever you do, it'll pick up and do C uh, 276, 277, 278, and just keep going on up ad infinitum. You can reset it so that we start all over again at C001, 0001, I think. Um, but neither of these modes really solve the problem of the fact that eventually you're going to have conflicts. So for example, what if you're copying files from one shooter, one different camera, you have like three Sony cameras and they all got these same file names. What's preferable is to rename all of your files at the ingest stage so that the file names themselves contain a, a of not too tediously long combination of the year, the month, the day, and the precise hours, minutes, and seconds when the footage was taken. That would prevent you from overwriting uh, any file accidentally or getting them confused with each other and so on. So Sony's got to figure this out. Their Catalyst suite of software is a complete failure. They went to a subscription model, which was, a, which was kind of humorous, um, as if they could compete with Adobe. So that was the way that they were going to you know, through the catalyst ingest process, properly name files where they fail inside the camera. Since nobody's using catalyst, we're left with this terrible situation where we have the simplistic file naming system. So I'm kind of mentioning it now, sort of preaching about it, but since Sony's clearly not going to change their minds after years and years of sticking to the simplistic file structure, it's something to really kind of be on top of. You can put a prefix in front of photo files, but then ironically, even that, that set file name prefix doesn't work on video files, so they screwed us there too. Wrapping up, recording media settings. Um, I mentioned this pretty early in this video, and this has to do with the fact that you can make it so that, firstly, um, it prioritizes recording first to slot one before deciding to move to slot two. But then in standard mode here, what that means is that it won't simultaneously record to both cards at the same time, and it won't do this sorting with regard to making decisions as between sidecar files of RAW and JPEG. But standard mode just basically says to this next category, do I auto switch the media so that if I'm not recording simultaneously on both cards uh, the same content, do I automatically switch from slot one to slot two and then if I had something in slot two right now, that would light up and show me that it's eligible for that. But leaving it on is, I mean, how could it be a bad idea, right? What it, what it won't do, and I've confirmed this, is that it won't auto switch to the second card, for example, and then overwrite any content that's on that card. I mean, if it fills up, it'll behave like it does on any half full card. Once it gets fully full, then it'll say, sorry, there's no more room. I've got to stop. 
as opposed to something crazy and dangerous like overwriting anything after it switches. And folder name, standard form, date form. Unfortunately, once again, that doesn't solve our problem of the actual file names being named the way we want them to. And, and then it leaves us video shooters out too. It's a very still centric quote solution. And finally, you can see what version you're on. This is a brand new camera, so surely, surely we're on uh, firmware version 1.0. Quick note is that the way to update the lens firmware, I mean, it's funny when you think about it, but lenses actually have internal electronics with firmware that are stored in CMOS. So um, when you perform a lens firmware update, it comes through the camera body, but the camera body in turn in reverse can read what the current firmware is for a lens. So I actually updated, this is the legendary favorite i mean seriously if you buy one lens for your entire um full frame e-mount lineup it's the zeiss 55 uh f 1.8 prime so that lens has received uh, a 0 0.2 0 0.02 it's really basically version 2 firmware update so this is how that's being indicated and setting reset says it's the nuclear option right okay and finally, um, I just, I think this is the end, right? Because I had mentioned that we'd come full circle and come back to the star where you can, at your own risk, start creating a, new, a camera um, to your dream's content, right? That does things differently than the defaults, that has a brand new menu. But again, you know, it's a romance that could break your heart because Sony will come along with a new camera and you'll have an affair on the A7R three and buy the a7r4 or the a7s3 and um and it's not like all of these will be able to be imported over to the next camera and then they might not all be relevant to the next sony model so i just don't know how much people will, will exploit this my menu setting but sony's onto something and i don't mind it at all thanks for listening to this incredibly tedious long video but as i said midway through this i do estimate this is the longest freaking manically uh, expansive menu guide to the a7r3 that exists on the internet so um, if you have any further comments to add about these uh, menu insights corrections and so forth comments are always welcome always unemotionally because this is tech gear after all take care everybody love to see your work please keep sharing them via focuspulling.com.